Okay, so that's that's the second factor. So the third factor you mentioned was the, the rate of return or the required rate of return. Right. The required rate of return is, uh, is the rate of return an informed investor looking at an asset would require before they would purchase the asset. I mean, um, there are uh, several theories in finance that help us uh, calculate what that uh, rate of return is. It's also referred to as the cost of capital. Um, I think the most common measures used for this, uh, certainly in the valuation community and also in the merger and acquisition and investment community, is really what's called the build-up method. And the build-up method uh, uh, is a method that incorporates uh, some information or theory from the capital asset pricing model, uh, CAPM as it's called, and adjusts for inadequacies in CAPM. So here's the way it would, it would, it would, it would basically run. The way we would uh, look at developing the cost of capital in this way, we'd start with the long-term treasury rate. And let's say, for example, that were 4%. To that, we would add what we call a market risk premium. And the market risk premium, let's say for argument's sake, is 7.8%. So we're already at 11.8% mm. already. And now, what does that 7.8% mean? It means, on average, academic studies have told us that, on average, that premium is the amount of incremental return an investor would require for investing in this particular asset rather than uh, investing in a risk-free treasury bond. All right, so that's a 78 then there's additional adjustments, and these additional adjustments emerge because of the inadequacy of the capital asset pricing model, at least the, the, not the theoretical inadequacy, but the empiricism of it. That is, when we go out and test to see whether the capital asset pricing model is accurate, what we find out, it's, it's, uh, it's error prone. And where do these errors come from? Well, the first major error has to do with size. Capital markets are very fixated on the size of a firm. Larger companies, whether it, this is true or whether it's true or not, this is this is this is what the perception is. In the capital markets, larger companies are uh, uh, less risky than smaller companies. And so, given if you have two companies in the same industry that have the same basic risks, uh, that is industry risks, they they suffer, they sell the same products and services, they sell to the same marketplace. Uh, the cost of capital for the smaller company will always be higher than the larger company. To give you an example of how this would occur is if you look at what we call the size premiums, they can range anywhere from almost nothing for a very, very large company to very small companies that where the size premium might be 12 or 13%. So it's not uncommon for a private firm who has a revenue of somewhere between five and $10 million to have a cost, to have a size premium, an additional rate of return an investor require in the 10 to 13 percent range. It's just not uncommon. And, and that's on top of That's it. on top of. So if we, if we, let's just, we take our 11.8 that we had and we add on top of that just to make the arithmetic simpler and another, another 10 percent, we're at 21.8 already. Um, now, in addition to that, there's something called the firm specific risk premium. Now, the firm-specific risk premium is, tends to be more contentious, and the reason is is because theory and finance would say that if, in fact, the, tr the buyer of a business could diversify away the risk of owning that business, um, then there's no reason why in the world he would pay or she would pay a, uh, a premium for, uh, or require, I should say, not pay a premium, but require a premium on the on on the uh, on the uh, on purchasing the business, uh, uh, saying it differently, uh, what this mean would be is that the that the buyer's r rate of return, required rate of return, shouldn't include this this firm specific premium, this additional return, uh, uh, because they can protect themselves from any risks associated with it. Now, in the public markets, there's no question that one can diversify away the risk and. So the, the risk that's essentially diversify away, away is called diversifiable risk. Mm -hmm. But for the private firm, that's not the case, because typically what happens when a private firm is bought, all the money that the owner has is actually put into the company, and they don't have any money left over to diversify. So that's a real risk, and they can't diversify away from it. And since they can't diversify away from it, uh, they, they want to incorporate that in their required rate of return. So 
what that translates to is that the required rate of return now is going to be higher. So if we're at 21.8 as a result of building it up so far, and we add another 5%, say, for firm-specific risk, we're already at 26.8%, uh, round numbers, let's say 27. Now, that's a very high rate of return if, in fact, the owner, the buyer of this company could diversify then maybe the required rate of return would only be 21.6. Now, what does this mean? It means that, that if the required rate of return were 21.6, if that was it, the buyer would be willing to pay more money for the business. Yes. Right? Since the 5% we're adding for firm-specific risk is, uh, brings us up to you know, approximately 27%, it translates to a lower price for the business. So the way the risk is actually... Uh, manifests itself in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the transaction or the market is that the greater the risk, the lower the price. The greater the risk, the higher the required rate of return. Mm -hmm. Now, that's all those really factor into the cost of equity, but you first were talking about the cost of capital. So how does debt function, uh, really factor into this? Uh, well, a firm, uh, the the firm has what's called a, co a cost of capital. If there's no debt, if the, firm, if, the, if the firm has no debt on the balance sheet, we would say that's a pure, that, that is 100% equity finance company. And so the cost of capital we just developed in that case, the 27% number, uh, would be the cost of capital that we would apply to the, the firm that we're going to value. Now, often what happens is that the buyer of the company who wants to buy it is financing the purchase with debt. Either they're borrowing the money from a bank, it could be borrowing it from the seller. In any case, there's a debt commitment that's made. And when that happens, when we incorporate the cost of that debt into the, with the cost of equity, we develop what's called a weighted average cost of capital. And the long and the short of all of this, the more debt used in the capital structure generally reduces the cost of capital uh, for the, uh, 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 the, the target cost of capital and it generally increases the value uh, of the firm. So we've got those three factors. We've got the size of the cash flow, the growth in the cash flows, and the required rate of return. Just, you know, in a general sense for our audience, how does that all come together then into uh, a number for the value of the firm? Well, w th there's uh, whichever method or metric is actually being used, we, if you think about this, we have a set of cash flows that we're going to forecast, project going forward. That's based on the starting size, and then we grow those cash flows. And then, then those cash flows will be discounted by the cost of capital. Uh, whether that's an equity cost of capital or what we call the weighted average cost of capital, including some debt, uh, depends on how the transaction is actually getting financed. But in any case, we have a cost of capital. And what we do is we take those cash flows, which are in the future, and use what's called present value techniques to bring them to the present. And when we take the cash flow, for an example, that uh, I'm going, I expect to receive three or four years down the road, and I discount that back to the present, and add all those discounted cash flows together, I get an estimate of what I think the firm is worth. 